This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service, Nebula, when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. How to do research at the MIT AI Lab. Step one, read this paper. Step two, see step one. In all seriousness, I found this paper on Twitter about a month ago and I thought it was really interesting. It was written by a bunch of MIT grad students in 1988, and it was supposed to serve as a guide for people who are new to both the AI lab as well as the larger field for how to get into research in AI and how to catch up to the field. It's something that I honestly wish that I had access to when I started getting into AI research because it has a lot of good advice. So for those who don't know, my PhD isn't actually in AI, it's in medical engineering through a joint Harvard-MIT program. In fact, the MIT AI lab doesn't really exist anymore, it's now the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab, or CSAIL, as well as the MIT IBM Watson AI lab. Having said that, I've been programming since I was in high school and I started getting into AI when I had the opportunity to do research in machine learning for radiology at Stanford during the summer after my junior year. And since then, I continue to use applied machine learning for neural signal processing and imaging throughout my graduate work. This is all to say that when compared to the field as a whole, I would say that I'm actually still pretty new to AI research, especially since a lot of my initial education was self-taught and I've spent a lot of my graduate studies focusing on filling in the gaps in the material that I never learned. I'm hoping that makes my perspective more valuable to you because a lot of people are now coming into the field from a similar self-taught background with not a ton of guidance on how to get involved in research. Also, if you're new to this channel, hi, I'm Jordan, and I'm fascinated by the ways that we interact with AI and algorithms on a day-to-day -day basis. You can subscribe to my channel to stay up to date on all the interesting things that are happening, and you can click the like button to let me know that you enjoyed this video. So the first half of this paper focuses on practical skills that you might want to develop, starting with reading papers. And honestly, I wish I'd done more of this when I started doing AI research because I jumped straight into tutorials to teach me how to make the models and didn't actually read up on how the models work. I think it's really important to understand how and why models are constructed, as well as how you choose the right model, how you choose the right optimizer, loss function, etc. The only thing that I would add to this section is that I would personally recommend starting with peer-reviewed research. When this guide was published, sites like Archive, which are preprint servers that publish articles before they've been peer-reviewed, didn't exist. However, in 2020, it's basically assumed that all papers in AI will go through Archive before they are formally published in a journal or in a conference. And that's really good for both sharing knowledge and getting feedback from the larger community, but it can also make it really difficult for anyone who's newer to the field to identify which papers are good and which papers are not so good. Plus, the sheer number of papers uploaded every day is daunting, to say the least. In fact, there's a funny line on the second page of the guide that says, since AI is still a small field, you can read a substantial fraction of the significant papers in a couple years which was probably true in 1988. Luckily, many people have cultivated reading lists on peer-reviewed papers for their field or subfield, so you don't have to dive in with no guidance. The next section focuses on networking, including infiltrating secret paper passing networks where unpublished drafts are circulated to others in the community, which I think at this point is just archive. The author also recommends sending papers of interest to peers in the field, whether it be people in your lab or people that you met at conferences. I definitely think that this is a great idea and also applies to field outside of AI. I know for my labs, we often share papers in Slack. In fact, we have dedicated papers channels where you can just post papers that you thought were interesting. Personally, doing this helps me learn about fields that are tangentially related to my work that may have some interesting insights or methods that I can use and that I wouldn't otherwise encounter given the narrow focus of my work. Of course, they recommend attending conferences and meetup groups if you can, which I absolutely recommend. However, this has become increasingly difficult for some of the big conferences as attending can be expensive and many are placing caps on the number of people that they'll allow in. I was really impressed that this guide also had a section on diversifying your research interests to include the humanities, social sciences, philosophy, and neuroscience in order to get alternate perspectives on your work, and I absolutely agree with that. They don't discuss AI ethics mostly because that wasn't really a field at the time, but obviously that would be added to the list now in 2020. 
As someone who came from a different scientific background, it's definitely interesting to see how my background informs the ways that I design models. For example, something that I think about a lot is clinical use and more broadly use by people who aren't me. There are times when there's a trade-off between making a model that performs slightly better and making a model that's more explainable or that performs better in clinical settings or that uses less resources than I might have available to me so that others with less resources can use it too. Writing is definitely an important skill and is something that I'm still working on when it comes to machine learning. In fact, I had to submit a report on a project that I did recently, and the hardest part of writing that report was describing my data so that other people who weren't familiar with my work could understand what I was doing. In particular, writing so that another scientist can understand and implement the work that you did is something that we can always stand to practice. As a large part of the reproducibility crisis in science isn't due to people falsifying studies, it's due to poor communication. Plus, writing things down helps you keep track of the list of things that you tried to do, whether or not they worked, and how you might have improved on them over time. Next up is talks. Talks are a great combination of networking, diversifying your interest, and reading papers. In fact, I usually try to go to one to two talks outside of my field per week just to see what other people are doing that might be interesting to me. Plus, unlike when you read a paper at a talk, your questions can be answered in somewhat real time. Interestingly, the last practical skill development section is on programming, and a lot of this section is a bit out of date. At the time, they used different programming languages than are commonly used now, and the entry-level skills or projects that you might try have changed a bit. However, it does still offer some good tips, including reading and understanding people's code. At some point, you will have to parse somebody else's code, and it will suck to varying levels depending on how well their code is written, but it will help you get better at reading other people's code, and it will also help you write better code yourself, because you'll see the places where you had trouble understanding people, and be sure not to do that when you publish your own. Now, this doesn't mean that when you're initially developing a model, it needs to be pretty. Mine certainly are not. However, once you're getting to the point of making it available to the public, it should be organized and written in a way that other people can reasonably understand. So the second half of this guide is much more focused on how to do research, especially as a grad student, so a lot of it wouldn't be useful to anyone who isn't doing graduate studies. If you are a grad student or a new researcher, you might want to read these sections more in depth, but in the interest of hitting on points that are more applicable to the broader public, I'm going to breeze through these sections a little more quickly. The sections focus on picking an advisor, writing a thesis, doing research, and the emotional labor of research. The last section in particular is interesting to me because it can be really hard to understand how much of an emotional roller coaster research can be without having done it yourself. There's a comic that often circulates through academic circles that describes what doing a PhD is like, but in short, you're trying to make a small dent in the vast expanse of things that human beings don't know. And that's really, really hard. Experiments often don't work or don't provide the results you expected, and you might spend months working on an experiment only to realize that you were asking the wrong question. In fact, as an undergrad, I spent three years working on a project that consistently failed for the first two years. So as the authors mentioned in this section, setting short and long-term goals on the progress that you'd like to make is important for both maintaining your sanity, but also documenting how far you've come. I'm coming to the end of my second year of my PhD right now, and initially I felt like I hadn't really gotten anything done, but as I've looked over my lab notebook and looked over my code, I've realized that I've done a lot more than I initially realized. Plus, just as neuroscience is a new field for me, AI might be a new field for you, so just catching up to where the field is is a great accomplishment. And that's how you do research at the MIT AI Lab. Hopefully this was interesting to you. These tips probably translate to other fields outside of machine learning, but obviously also aren't the end-all be-all of doing research. So if you have any questions, let me know and I'll do my best to answer them. In fact, if you'd like to learn more about my journey through AI, you can check out the video in the card up top. And if you'd like to learn more about the future AI, you should check out CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is a subscription streaming service with thousands of documentaries and nonfiction videos. Personally, I've been watching their videos on the future of AI this week, and it's been pretty interesting. In fact, since many of us need something to watch while social distancing, CuriosityStream is offering a 40% off stay at home deal, so you can get all of this for only $12 a year at curiositystream.com Jordan. With your CuriosityStream subscription, you'll also get access to my videos ad-free on Nebula, a streaming platform built by and for independent creators like me. CuriosityStream loves independent creators and wants to help us grow our platform, so they're giving my viewers free access to Nebula when you sign up at the link below. 
By signing up to Curiosity Stream, you'll be helping not just me, but the entire educational community as we work together to build a place where we can create creative content that would be just too risky to rely on YouTube. Otherwise, you can check out my video on my journey through AI up here, and you can subscribe to my channel and let me know that you like this video by smashing the like button down here. If you'd like to learn more about my PhD life, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Thanks again to all of my patrons, and I will see you guys next Friday. Bye!